Okay, gents, let's switch gears a little bit, focusing on the Premier League and recapping match week five. What did we learn? What was the big takeaway? Andy Edwards, I'm going to come straight to you. Takeaway from the action over the last week. What do you think about that? What really stuck out for you? Uh, so I teased it a little bit in the intro. I'm a little bit worried early season about Manchester City. Uh, oh. <sighs> The striker thing, we talked about it all summer. Are they going to get Kane? Are they going to get Holland? Uh, are they going to end up getting Messi uh, for like 12 hours? I, I think that was a consideration. <laughs> uh, they were linked with a lot of players, this 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 uh, transfer window, and they ended up signing none of them to play that center forward position. Obviously, Sergio Aguero left, and he went to Barcelona. Gabriel Jesus is still there. Ferran Torres has kind of played in that position a little bit. It's just, I, I think we overlooked... Uh, are we oversimplified, I guess? Well, you know, this is kind of how Pep wants to play. So this will be fine. They, they can get by for another season without a striker, and they, they can win the title still. And, and just because Pep wants to play that way doesn't mean that it's the best way for this team to play. And we've already talked about Lionel Messi uh, this week, and, and I mentioned just how uh, the, the best for Messi, the best for Barcelona when Messi and, and Guardiola was there was when he was playing as, as a false nine. So I think we have kind of almost come up with this narrative for Guardiola where we say, well, the, the best Barcelona team played with, without a, a number nine. It was Messi as a false nine. That's Messi. You, you can't, you, you can't uh, you know, equate Messi in arguably the greatest club team that has ever played the game and, and, and extrapolate that to Guardiola at any other club. And obviously he had Lewandowski at Bayern in between. So I just, I don't know, I, I feel like they need a striker there. And obviously Harry Kane was the perfect fit, They but they decided as a club, or maybe it was Guardiola, maybe it was the board, whoever it was, that that wasn't the worthy investment at, at that time. And, and I think come the end of the season, they're probably going to regret that just a little bit. Nick, do you agree with that point? And anything else stuck out in your mind? I mean, Tottenham-Chelsea was a heck of a game, really a game of two halves. I know it's a cliche, but I was at that game in North London and uh, thought Spurs were in with a good shout when, when half time came along and then N'Golo Kante turned up and the game turned on its head. But yeah, do you want to kind of expand on the Man City point? Are you concerned about them as well? Because for me, there is a way to play and we've seen them demolish teams with attacking midfielders and free throwing football. But there also is that almost a plan B, right? We need a big man up there. We need to get someone to hold the ball up and pin teams in. They don't really have that option, do they, to, to switch the game up because they don't have the players. I mean, Gabriel Jesus has been playing on the wing. Sterling's been playing up front at times. And Ferran Torres, who's kind of a winger, has been playing centrally. So it's kind of an issue, isn't it? It is. And also, it depends how you view last season, too, because uh, Sergio Aguero wasn't really playing a ton. And he was also, when he was there, there were questions about his fitness and where he was and all of that. So they've done it before. Um, and I think maybe defied the odds in doing it, which is which is you know a big part of the question. What I worry about is we talked last week, or at least I did. I made the point that I thought that these these games where we saw the big teams go at it uh, were going to be so big, so much bigger than usual, because those three points, that sort of six pointer at the top of the table, was going to matter so much more. And then I watched Tottenham hang with Chelsea on less rest. And I remembered that how teams react to midweek European act action is yeah. absolutely massive. Mm -hmm. um, whether you're getting off a plane or at home, the depth issue it is some of these teams look at who is on Tottenham's bench. Um, with all due respect to those players, there were not game changers on their bench. And when you throw into, if you were to tell them, hey, you're going to play, Harry Kane's not going to be anywhere near his best, and you're going to hit halftime at nil nil. I think they sign up for that every time at this stage in the new Noah Espirito Santo um, experimentation project, whatever. So I worry about how teams adjust to this stretch. And I mentioned it last week, Man City's next three games uh, after their League Cup outing, absolute nightmare. So maybe the group stage and how teams shake out of that, how they are going into the last group stage game. Do they need that game or can they kind of play it off? That yeah. may make all the difference in a title race. Absolutely. And that kind of reminds me what you said there, that point about fitness and being sharp. After the Tottenham-Chelsea game I was at, I was driving home and I called Andy and we were having a chat about the game and uh, breaking it all down. And I, I said Tottenham looked great, but I was concerned because of how fast they were closing Chelsea down. Yeah. I mean, I was 20 yards away from it and Deli Alley and Dombele. 
they were great for 45 minutes, the sprints, the shuttles. It was like watching Spurs under Pochettino again. But there was no way on earth that they could live and with Chelsea and do that for a full 90 minutes. And then it, obviously, as soon as N'Golo Kante came on, the tempo changed. It's a pretty simple change, wasn't it? A defensive change from Thomas Tuchel bringing off Mason Mount, bringing on N'Golo Kante, but just wrestle control midfield. And I think that really, to me, the big lesson I learned from the weekend is that Thomas Tuchel is a master tactician. Just those little in-game tweaks that it's weird, right? If you're a Chelsea fan and you're thinking, we need to go for Tottenham, we're taking off an attacking midfielder and bringing on, okay, the best defensive midfielder in the world, but how's that going to work? We're not really changing the formation, but it worked to treat and it just kind of pinned Tottenham back. And I think for the morale of the Chelsea team to be like, okay, we have N'Golo Kante in there. We, we now have a, a much better chance of dominating this game. And I think it was quite demoralizing for Tottenham as well to see that that bloke come off the bench and seeing the strength of Ch uh, Chelsea's bench as well, Nick, because you mentioned it there. Tottenham's bench wasn't strong. And I think the strength of the squad, just like last season, is going to be huge in this title race, be it Man United, Man City. If Liverpool can stay lucky with injuries as they have done so far this season, then it's, that's going to play a big, big part in this title race. Um, on the flip side of the coin, Andy, which teams are we worried about? I mean, poor old Norwich. I think it's 15 Premier League defeats in a row now. Five this season, 10 in a row when they were last in the Premier League. And they look like they haven't learned any of their lessons from the last time they were in the Premier League under Daniel Farker. And Nick, I hate to say it, Newcastle as well. A positive display against Leeds, but... Are you kind of concerned about them, but let's go with Andy and maybe on Norwich first. Uh, I am not concerned about Norwich. I, I already have Norwich back in the EFL <laughs> Championship, so that that has been decided. That that's been settled. Uh, they they are awful. I think I've watched three of their five games so far this season, and they have offered absolutely nothing in the middle third of the field. They'll try to get forward and attack a little bit irresponsibly, I should say. They'll try to defend a little bit and sit in deep. They're not very well disciplined. They're not well drilled. It doesn't work out well. There's just nothing to like about that, and I think you hit the nail on the head there, Joe, is the same issues they had 18 months ago when they were last leaving the Premier League. They still have all those same issues. They still have no leadership in that team. They still have a goal poaching center forward who's approaching 35 years old and is an automatic starter every single game, whether he scores a goal or not, when he contributes nothing other than the. There's just, yeah, Norwich, it, it'll be a fun eight months and then, you know, it'll be right back down to the second division. There you go. Andy Edwards is uh, stay by the mailbox. You're definitely going to get invites to, to go along to Norwich and watch them play very, very soon indeed. Um, Nick, Newcastle, do you want to talk about them or just... Oh, okay. Listen, ask, ask me after the weekend. Uh, they're, going to to <laughs> they're going to Vicarage Road. They're going to Vicarage Road. They're going to be rested because um, they stink in cup competitions. And so <laughs> I think with, uh, with St. Maximin and they're going to get Callum Wilson back and they haven't had John Joe Shelby yet at all. There are some very good pieces there. But where are we going to be looking at them after this weekend? Because I think they have to be a team that can go to Watford and win. And I, Ismail Yassar is fantastic. Yes. Uh, Dennis is fantastic. They have some very good players. But if you look at Newcastle and who you want them to be, given their talent, it's better than Watford. It's at least taking a point from Watford. Um, otherwise, you're in, a, you're in the muck. You're in the muck with Burnley, who has proven, kind of like Newcastle, that they'll find their way out of it. Um, I, I don't know who to really worry about at this point, but I'm looking at, I know this sounds crazy because of how well they've played at times, but over the season, Watford, Newcastle, Burnley, um, who's going to not get the luck for a little while and then be sitting there worried? Is Raul Jimenez not going to come back to form for Wolves? There's going to be a surprise team that shouldn't be down there on talent that is down there into the season and maybe at the end of the season. Yeah, it's still early days. There's still early days, lads. There's no need to get you know too carried away yet uh, on the positive or negative side of things. But there are some patterns emerging now pretty early in the season that we think is going to play out for the entire campaign. Quick one. Who was the star of the weekend? I loved Alan Sir Maximin. Obviously, incredible goal. Just an incredible character. I feel like every fan in the world would love for him to be playing on their team and the way he celebrates and social media, the way he uses that. I mean, I was at... Excited for Sadio Mane to continue his good start as well. Another goal against Crystal Palace. And Jesse Lingard, classy non-celebration, I thought, uh, after banging that great goal in for Man United away at West Ham. And he appreciated what the Hammers had did uh, to, to rejuvenate his career. Any other stars of the weekend there? Yeah, Ismail Asar. 
Yeah. Nick mentioned that he yeah. he completely took over uh, the game against Norwich on the weekend, and I, and I was watching that one, so I got to really appreciate kind of how far he's come in the last couple of years. Because remember, two years ago when they got relegated with Norwich, he was he got linked with some of the Premier League clubs that he might just transfer and stay up. He went down to the Championship, dominated down there, and I think it did him a lot of good this season. And on St. Max, he's just the per- what is it with Newcastle with these very mercurial really bold personality French playmakers. Ben Arfa, uh, not too long before him, you know, obviously St. Max without some of the off-field extracurriculars going on there. Uh, he's just, he's so, he's he's delightful. He's just joyful in every way. David Ginola back in the day yeah. as well, of course. And then a non-Frenchman, Festino Espria. I just kind of, there's something about, yeah, yeah those mercurial playmaker, playmakers up at St. James's Park and how to make the fans get on the edge of their seats. And yeah. Everywhere, I think football fans just love that. So more of that from St. Max would be absolutely sensational to see. Okay, analysis, reactions, recaps, whatever you need on the Premier League action. We have you covered here at Pro Soccer Talk on NBCSports.com. The three chaps you can see on the screen will have you covered with all the games throughout the season, all 380 of them. It's been a great start to the season, lads. So we've learned a lot already. We learn a lot more each and every weekend. Still trying to figure it out. The dust is kind of setting, settling now a little bit. So it's definitely fun to see this all play out. Hi there. I'm Rebecca Lowe, studio host for NBC's coverage of the Premier League. Don't forget to hit subscribe to watch highlights all season long and be sure to tune in for Premier League mornings every weekend at 7 a.m. Eastern. And for even more content, head over to Peacock, where we've got live games, original series and a dedicated round-the-clock Premier League channel featuring studio shows, classic matches and much more.